Hey y'all, I built this presentation uh, a couple of years ago, I guess, and uh, some of the pictures that you're going to see on there I grabbed off of, you know, internet, public domain stuff, but um, they're not going to be covered all of that intensively, but I'm going to run through some slides. I've got a pretty good bunch of slides here, but i got a couple of stories to tell too, and um, I thought I would just uh, jump into this thing and uh, I like for these things to be 30 minutes or less, so that's one of the reasons I'm kind of pushing here. So here we go. Um, most of the p people under recognize this, and you know, hypoid gears, a lot of times you may hear about hypoid gear lubricant. Hypoid gears basically mean that the pinion is coming in above or below the center line. If you put an X right across that ring gear, if the... Uh, Pinions coming in above or below that, they're high point. If it's coming straight in, they're just bevel cut gears. You also see these curves, you know, it gives us quietness and strength typically. Uh, you know, you got a coast side, the drive side of the gear, and you can kind of see this little bit of a wear pattern right here where it's supposed to be, right in the center of that tube, and that's something we set up. But rear differential service for maintenance or repair work, like leak and seals, we got to pull the rear axles and rain or replace the differential fluid. Now, on the older units, a lot of them, and uh, even on some of the uh, later model Asian stuff, you'll see these, uh, what I call the pumpkin type or the Rockford style, where, where the pumpkin comes out the front, you know, but they'll have bolts going, holding the axles in, where you got holes in the axle flanges where you reach in there with sockets and take those out and pull the axles out. Nothing holding them on the inside, they're held by flanges on the outside, and they're riding in their bearings there. You know, pull those out, and then you pull all of the, 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 the rear housing is welded, then you pull all of the bolts out, you, know, you can pull the drive shaft out, and you jerk that pumpkin out of there. And um, that makes it very easy if you've got another pumpkin that's already set up that you got off of a junk vehicle to set up your ring gear and pinion. I mean, in other words, not to set it up, but to, well, it's easier to set up too, but it's easier to change the gear ratio really quickly and easily. And uh, I got I've done that before and made a difference in my gas mileage. This is another story. Differentials on these linear platforms, meaning the engine is north-south. Uh, straight, you know, in other words, front to back. Uh, they hadn't changed much over the past 70 years or so, but the prices of the differential parts vary. We did a ring, I mean, a, a set of spider gears on a 98 F-150. Uh, positive traction. And the spider gears were not very much. They were cheap. The, the spider gears, I remember when I bought them at the, uh, and it's from a Ford place, bought spider gears from Ford place, it was about $60 back whenever we did it. That must have been 15 years ago. Um, and we, we bought that, bought the spider gears. They were all busted up because he'd been coon dogging it or something. On a Chevrolet, about two weeks later, we had to put the spider gears in it, and the spider gears in that one were $500. And they look back pretty much the same gears. I'm sure they wouldn't fit because of sizes and whatnot. But there's no reason whatsoever why on a Ford they should be 50 or $60 for a set of spider gears, which would be those little center gears, you know. And they'd be that much more on a Chevrolet. Now, your rear axle fluid is more important than you might think. And, you know, we always would pull that uh, pipe th uh, plug out and squirt enough fluid in there to where we could touch it with our finger. Well, some of these uh, Chevrolet pickups starting around the turn of the century, you know, 2000, 2001, 2, whatever, uh, they were supposed to be, they used full synthetic oil, which is really expensive, and they were supposed to be 40 millimeters below the hole, you know, which 40 millimeters is a pretty good bit below the hole, which I thought was, that was interesting too, because I always liked that thing to be up there where I can touch it with my finger, you know. Um, there's a little tag there by where you put the oil in on some of those. I, 40 millimeters may not be what I read, but it seemed like I remember it being that. And that's a heck of a lot, too. That's over an inch, you know. So, anyway, that sounds like there wasn't a lot of oil in there. But, anyway, follow those instructions and make sure you're putting the right kind of oil in it, too. Uh, low gear ratios, you know, got that, uh, you know, high gear ratio. This, you know, plus a low and high. Low would be 331. 355, 373, 410, 430. I had a uh, an F-150 one time that was getting, uh, well, it, i tell you when it was, it was in 1978, it was getting uh, 
I bought it. It was a 74 model. Had 332 gears under it, which is a screwball ratio, but it had the Rockford style rear end. And um, I wound up having to uh, change the differential chunk from 332s to 275s, which came out from under a Ranchero that I found at the salvage yard. And I did a swap with the guy. I said, I'll just trade you these and $25 for that other chunk. Put it in there, and it doubled my gas mileage, believe it or not. And I still had pretty good pulling power. Doesn't seem like I would, but I did. Um, but anyway, this has got to do with how many turns of this gear will give you one turn of that gear. That's what that's about. Most everybody knows this if you've done a lot of mechanic work. Well, the best way to remove some of the confusion is, is, and avoid problems is remember the basics and know a few basic things. Most of the differentials are either full floating axles or semi floating axles, which, you know, knowing the difference. This is a floating axle. That axle is not carrying the weight of the vehicle, it's just driving it forward in space. The tube that the axle bearing, I mean, the, the axle, bear, axle tube is actually carrying the weight of the vehicle. You'll see this on three quarter ton trucks and on one ton trucks and on the bigger trucks because you're not given this uh, little axle right here. On this kind of rear end, this axle is carrying the entire weight of the vehicle. Uh, and it's also driving it down the road, so there's a heck of a lot of stress on that axle. But for really heavy duty uh, uh, stuff, you're going to have this bolted on there. What's really annoying about this is sometimes these things, when you once you take the bolts out, it's not just take the bolts out and pull the axle flange off. Some of them will have those little, uh, depending on what the application is, they'll have those little uh, cone-shaped split deals in there. And those things can be aggravating to get out. You know, you got to kind of tap on them and hope they'll come loose and all that. Uh, but that's, a, you know, keep that thing tightened up and centered. Well, why is full floating axle instead of semi floating axle? I've already explained that. Uh, that's basically so that the weight of the vehicle is not being carried. See, this one broke right here. But it didn't break because it was carrying the weight of the truck. It broke because it twisted off. And whenever an axle like that breaks, it will, I mean, they don't all break the same way. It can break various different ways depending on wherever the weak link in the chain is. Um, and usually it's pretty simple to pull these out. You know, have you something under to catch the oil when you pull that flange out, and then you grab your axle, bring it on out of there. And, all right, and your semi floating axle would be that one there. You know, the bearing is right here. And you, you got a little bit of weight carried by these, but uh, most of it is carried right out here. And that's what that was about. And so, you know, you got your axle there, you got your bearing. Now, those are, uh, those kind right there that's got the bearing, uh, you know, the, the pumpkin type particularly, would be, uh, this wouldn't be the pumpkin type. This is the other kind we call the Dana or the Spicer or whatever the Spicer, that's the type of it, and also a brand name. Uh, but anyway, the ones that have the flanges in here, when you pull it out and pull the pumpkin out, uh, the bearing has got to be changed, you know, sometimes it takes special tools to do that. And on some of those Toyota Tundras and stuff, it's a booger bear. Uh, we've done them, but anyway. Um, now you got torsion stress, you got tensile stress of it pulling apart, and then you got shear stress. So that's three different types of stress that can, you know, usually you won't have any shearing going on with these. Um, but, uh, except maybe if you want to talk them twisting that, uh, flange off the end of that axle earlier. Um, there's one right there. There was a International Scout. I was working at the, uh, back in the 80s, I worked at a, for a little while at the uh, International Truck Dealer up here. And the Scout brought this International Scout in there. And this had happened on that Scout. And um, it had, and, the re and I don't know, uh, it was probably due to the fact that his, uh, the carrier, in the differential broke and it, it was able to spread out a little bit and because it was able to spread out a little bit the C-clip came off and the axle came out and uh, he, he saw that um, you know happen he was basically looking out there because he was hearing the noise and he saw the axle come out must have been pretty scary I wonder he didn't crash but I asked him because these gears are matched these uh, the, the ring gear and the pinion you can't just take a ring gear and a pinion that you know, even if they're the same part number and pop them in there together because they're going to sing and make noise because they are matched when they're built. And uh, anyway, I told him I needed to replace the uh, carrier, but I, was, I didn't know if he had mismatched the gears or not. 
you know, because the gears can get mismatched if they're driven long whenever they're not, you know, the preload's not right on the bearings and they can move other ways besides just turning. And uh, he said, well, I didn't hardly drive it at all. I just, it, it should be just fine. And so I put that uh, carrier on there, which is pretty expensive, it was brand new. And uh, when I put it all back together and I painted it up and I set the rear end up so that the gear pattern was right. And that thing was as singing up a storm. It's just as noisy as all get out. And so I, I told the guy that I was working for, I said, this ain't going to work. I said, this is a nasty, noisy set of gears that need to be replaced. And uh, he said, there is a, a, a differential from an international scout down there laying in the back of the shop. Been down there for a while. And if it's got the same gear ratio, of course, you know, if it's four-wheel drive, the gear ratio is going to be the same front and rear. If it's the same gear ratio as that one, go ahead and take the ring gear and pinion out of that one down there and put it in there. So I went down there and I took the cover off of that thing and it was slammed full of water. And the gears were all pitted and rusty looking and I says, good grief, we can't use these. So I went back up there to the boss man and I says, well, this is not, this ain't worth a flip. I said, this, these things have got, are pitted with rust and they're just, they look, uh, uh, how long has it been back there? He says, it doesn't matter, pull them out and put them in there. Well, he was paying the bill, I mean, he was paying me. And so I pulled the darn things out and went and popped them in there. Set, that, set them up, you know, just like I would, you know, if they were new gears. And they were so quiet, you couldn't hear them. I guess because of all of those pits, they had a lot of room for grease to be, I don't know. Uh, but one way or another, that was a surprise to me. Um, this little C-clip right here, though, you can see how if the differential housing, this housing here broke, it would enable that to spread apart. And that C-clip, it just falls off of there, and then the axle could come right on out, you know. Anyway. Uh, how about these here? You know, you bust those uh, uh, joints, those uh, cross U joints. Coon dog it does that on a four wheel drive. Uh, and the axle's weak by design, sometimes it pops, you know, one way or another. There's a bunch of broken axles. And, all right, so here's a problem. See that one there? Somebody, somebody either uh, were modifying something or they this one broke and they put a piece of pipe on it and they always tack welded it. You know, that's not going to hold anyway. And if you're going to do that, you need to put it, you know, weld it all the way around. That was a weak problem there. And, uh, all right, so somebody got rough with this one here. He just popped it right on off of there. You know, and, uh, hard driving can break either kind. See those are twisted, how they begin to twist before they break. And sometimes you just have to stop and fix it. I thought that was a funny picture there. That guy working over there beside the road. All right, so I saw this one here. There was a big old uh, international ton and a half truck that had an eight liter engine in it. And it was nearly brand new. And uh, we had it down there when I was working at Sabine Offshore. And they, uh, one of the things that I was tasked to do on that truck was to put one of these micro brake lock things on there. And what that does is you put it in there in your brake line between the master cylinder brake. And then whenever you flip this lever down and you pump the brake, it basically keeps the fluid at the wheels. And it's like a, you know, a hydraulic park brake of sorts, I guess. You know, if you don't blow a wheel cylinder or something, you got good solid. But it holds better than a regular park brake. And so um, I put that thing on there because they told me to put it on there. And uh, one pump crew got back that truck down there and was doing some kind of a job with it. I don't know what it was. And um, the shift changed. Well, the pump crew that backed it down there flipped this lever on this brake lock, stomped it, the, a lot of pressure onto the, and when you do that, the pedal gets really hard because the pressure's, you know, being held back there. You release it by flipping that lever back the other way. Well, some knothead later on that didn't know anything about this brake lock was getting in the truck trying to pull it out of there. And instead of realizing there was a problem when it wouldn't move, he just kept on uh, hot dogging that eight liter engine and that big strong drive line and he twisted an axle uh, in two on one side back there on that thing. Just tore it all up. I had to fix all that. That was that. Um, now this here, you know, this happens in traffic. That's another one of those, you know. Uh, and these right here, you know how they keep, it's, if you see one that keeps breaking and breaking and breaking, you either got driver error or something going on. Um, all right, so CV joint instead of a regular U joint. Uh, is this right here, Anybody that's ever done much work and tried to use an impact wrench with a conventional regular wiggler on the end of an extension, 
whenever you're trying to turn that thing, let's say you're turning it with your drill and it's quarter inch. If you bend that thing too sharp, it goes, mm, 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 mm. you know how it does it. It gets fast and slow, fast and slow. That's why they call this one constant velocity. That's also why your impact socket, uh, impact wiggler is a constant velocity joint. That's a good way to illustrate that. Because uh, when you can bend it around there to a certain angle and spin it, it's got the same amount of torque it's given the whole time. It's not getting hard and easy and hard and easy and hard and easy, you know. Yeah, that's one of the reasons we do that. They did have these on some of the early 70s uh, and some other platforms too. Uh, Chevys and some of the Lincolns and stuff had two uh, of these U-joints, you know, those cross U-joints stacked in there in a housing like that. Those are aggravating to fix. Um, now, you got to understand the different styles. This is the pumpkin. You see you got a flange here where you bolt that in. And there will be a, usually there will be a collar that's pressed on that's holding that bearing on there. And those can be annoying. Like say some of your Toyotas have got this kind on there. Uh, this right here is really cool though because you can set up your preload and you can set your backlash, which your backlash means you're moving the ring gear back and forth to give more clearance in there. The pinion depth is important too though. And you got to be able to get that set up. Uh, usually the pinion depth doesn't vary a whole lot, but there's some tools that I used to use when I was teaching over at the college where they, we had to, you know, forward head that you had to set that thing up and determine what your pinion depth was going to be by, you know, putting a bunch of tools in there with the bearings that were going to be used and all that. And then whenever you decided what that uh, shim was, the thickness of that shim, it gave you your pinion depth. And then you would work on your backlash and you were supposed to have, you know, like... Uh, I don't know, six or eight or ten thousandths backlash, you know, that's how much the gears are going to go clunk, 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 clunk when you're measuring them with your dial indicator and all that. But anyway, this is the kind that I had on the 74 Ford pickup that I swapped out and got better fuel economy with. All right, so max sets only. This is kind of funny. There was a whining rear end in an old big truck that some of the people were working on back there. There was a guy named Buford and he used to have grease on his nose just about all the time. And uh, believe it or not, I'm not saying you should try this or even do it or think about it, but he jacked one of these trucks up and he pulled the cover off uh, and he washed all of the oil out of it. Or maybe he didn't, I don't know. But he smeared valve grinding compound all over the gears. I mean, so that the gears were completely and totally coated with valve grinding compound. And he had that thing up on those stands and he let it run with them gears working in gear with the wheels turning for about four to six hours with that valve grinding compound on those gears. He may have stopped it and added some more, I don't know. But at the end of that day, those gears weren't noisy anymore. He was basically matching the gears, lapping them in with valve grinding compound. Uh, you know, I've, I've never uh, done that, but it seems to make sense that it might work, although you might be just wasting a lot of time. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, rough trailer hookup, spinning the wheels, you can bust those gears. That doesn't usually happen, but when it does, somebody did something really bad wrong. Alright, alright, so then you got this uh, granular fracture, the surface kind of uh, flakes off, you know, you've seen stuff do like that before. Uh, whenever you're building something like gears that are really, really, really hard like that, you may run into a problem like that. Drive pinion, that's what I was talking about. That's a similar failure to that axle. Uh, and incidentally, if you're when you're setting pinion depth, just to show you, the shim for to, to set the pinion depth goes between that bearing and that gear. And this is a press fit right here too. And though it's really important to have the the uh, uh, preload set on those bearings, just like it's supposed to be. You actually take an inch pound torque wrench and see how much torque it takes to keep it turning. Usually the whole rear end, if it's set up right, will be 21 or 22 inch pounds of torque. Not it takes to get it turning, and it needs to be a torque wrench. It's one of those little uh, beam types with the needle, you know, where the uh, shaft of the wrench pulls and the needle stays straight, and it's got a little curved scale on it. That's the kind you need to use for that. And there's your catastrophic fatigue failure. They call these beach marks. You know, overloading the vehicle beyond rated capacity. I believe they call that beach marks because it looks like a little beach. All right, so we got a fatigue crack right there, and uh, you know you got to think about how much pressure is on these things and how hard they're having to work all the time. It's really amazing. There's not more failures or differentials than there are. Uh, usually there will be if there's some 
somebody giving it a hard, you know, driving too hard. Uh, there's your torsional fatigue failure, you know, just uh, started little cracks, like stress cracks around there, and then it popped out of there. There's some more beach marks. Yeah, it looks like a little beach. And you got pitting here, um, you know, which that can begin to weaken that gear so it starts to try to shear that tooth off. But usually it'll just be noisy, uh, you know, one way or another. You know, incorrect lube, contaminated lube, over continuous overloading, and uh, bad bearings, you know. Uh, it's a good idea to have the right tools to get those bearings off there. Now I have actually cut those bearings almost all the way through and then got a chisel and hit them and you can break them and then they'll just come right on off of there. Now that's typically what we do when we're changing out those uh, you know, bearings of that style that are pressed on because it's hard. There is a tool you can grab under here and a little thing you put here so that you can pull it off with a puller. Uh, but you can do it faster than that if you don't care about the bearing and you're going to replace it anyway. Um, one of the things that seemed to be hardest for students to understand when I was teaching differentials was backlash. And I would explain it and I would show them pictures and I'd demonstrate it. And when I would have them over doing a final exam, they would have the dog on this thing out here like that, which is basically like you're checking the uh, out around or whatever. Uh, and this tool right here, we had one of those. That thing's pretty doggone handy. Cost five or six hundred dollars to buy one. You could just about build one if you were good in the shop. But anyway, that right there, whatever you, you if you spread that case too far, you're going to ruin it. So you got to make sure you're only spreading it enough to get this out. But that's the preload. You see. The preload on those bearings, and there's shims that go behind there, and you can act, you're changing your preload, and you start out when you're building this thing up. You got some that uh, will push in and out of there with your thumb, so you can change the one from one side to the other, not for preload but for backlash. And then whenever you take those out, there's a tool where you tap one in there that's tighter, so that the bearings are preloaded properly, because you don't want those gears doing anything except just turning in their bearings. You don't want them moving around like this. This is aluminum. A lot of vehicles have got aluminum differentials on them now. Uh, my Explorer's got aluminum differential. You do not put a floor jack under that thing and jack it up. That is a bad idea. Don't even go there. Don't even think about it unless you're looking to buy somebody a differential chunk because you are, you are going to destroy that housing if you get under there with a jack. You might have got by with it at a time or two, but sooner or later it's going to cost you. Uh, if you can't find the specs and the tag's gone, count the pinion and ring gear teeth to find the ratio. 10 tooth pinion gear, 35 ring. What ratio is that? You can also, uh, you know, look at it in such a way if you've got the cover off, you can make a mark on your drive shaft or on your flange back there and on your ring gear and you can count the turns and you can pretty well get really close to what that ratio is. The number of turns of the drive shaft to the turn of the wheels is what that is. Um, if the differential seals are leaking, look at the breather. A little breather. It's usually a little. One of the most popular videos I've got on my channel is where I put a differential seal in, because this was stopped up. And whenever you, if you're ever checking the, if you're ever checking the gear grease on one, and you screw that plug out, and it goes, whenever you screw the plug out, you best be checking that vent, or you're going to have leaking seal sooner or later. If you do have pressure in there, and it looks like the seal is leaking a little bit, what you can do is clean the vent, and then let them drive it and see if the seal keeps leaking. Uh, of course, you can't just change that seal by spinning that off with an impact wrench. You're going to have to uh, count the turns on that nut. You know, lock everything down, count the turns on the nut, and when you put it back on, put it the same. It's usually about 16 turns. You're supposed to use a new nut when you put it back together. Um, but if you don't put that thing right back where it was, there's a crush sleeve in here between those bearing, or between that outer bearing and that little boss on the pinion shaft. And if you go too far with that, you got to pull all that back, pull the seal the bearing all back out and put a new crush leave in there and go back and do it again. You don't, you don't go too far and then come back. That's not something you can do with that. Set and pinion bearing preload and ring gear backlash is an art more than a science. It's the gear contact pattern that tells you if you have it right. You paint it like you're painting your porch. You turn it through and you look and see how those gears. It's supposed to be giving you a pattern that's real similar to that. That one's almost too high. It ought to be down there in the center of that gear. All right. If you got incorrect tire inflation, or if you've got tires that are wrong side on either side of the differential, in other words, different size, smaller on this side and that side, those gears are working all the time. Uh, they're not supposed to be working unless you're turning. And the reason they're in there is so you, because one wheel's going faster than the other, 
and they need to work. But when they're driving state down the road, those gears don't, don't need to be working against each other. They just need to be doing, you know, pulling the thing down the road. Now, a donut is bad for the differential. Some vehicles, I, I changed a tire on a Cadillac one day out there beside the road, and the donut on that one was the same diameter as the regular tire, which they did that on purpose to make sure you didn't cause a lot of differential damage. On some of your Asian cars, you'll destroy the differential if you put the donut on that. You're supposed to put the donut on the back if the differential's in the front. And you may have to change two tires to do that. Seals leak, vents clog, bearings growl, gears whine, differentials work hard. They need regular maintenance. And the differentials often overlooked when the vehicle inspections are done. Remember to check the all the gearbox on front wheel drive vehicles. Toyota Camrys have got a little old plug in the differential area that uh, that do that. I mean that you're supposed to pull out and check that. The dipstick is not going to tell you what's in the differential on some of them Toyota Camrys, so be aware of that. All right, I got just another minute or two. I'm going to tell you a little story. I had a uh, 78 F250 that I was working on when I was down in Texas, and uh, those big nuts to hold the bearings in this floating axle, the skinny nuts, you know, this big around, and uh, one of them broke. The other one screwed off or actually took the threads off the end of the axle. And because the bearings were letting the axle, you know, do this, it broke right there inside there. So I pulled all that apart and I said, well, I can't put that back together like that because the axle housing is ruined. And so I called the Ford place and the axle housing was $1,000. And the guy that was in charge, he wanted me to maybe find an axle housing that wasn't quite so pricey. So I found one at a salvage yard for 200 bucks. And it was exactly like the one that was on the truck, uh, from a different year model maybe, but it was just like one on the truck. So when I put that thing together, no matter how far I moved the ring gear away from the pinion, it would lock up. And so what I did was I took, because I was working in that industry down there, you know, there's a lot of stuff that most shops just don't have available to them real easy. I took the ring gear off of the carrier, and I carried it over to the old man that was working at the, uh, at the lathe, and I says, can you chuck this thing up in your lathe and take 125 thousandths of an inch off of the place where the ring gear bolts to that carrier? And he said, yeah, I can do that. So he chucked it up and he machined that thing off. It was just beautiful. The thing was beefy enough to where it didn't weaken it, you know. And it was an eighth of an inch in that much anyway. I put that thing back together and I set it up and it was just like brand new. Uh, but sometimes when you're working on these rear ends, you got to think outside the box. And you got to be patient when you put one together and the pattern's not right. You don't want to say, I'd be a eight, you know, because a lot of times you'll mismatch the gears. You'll wind up with a, a whining, singing rear end that... You know, if you don't put it together and set the gears up, it's going to sing, it's going to whine, and somebody's going to be unhappy with it, and you're probably not going to be happy because they're going to want it back. And if they sung and if they drove it singing long enough, the gears may be mismatched to where there's no way you can fix it without putting a fresh set of gears in it. Uh, but uh, anyway, that uh, pretty well winds up the video for today, and um, I really appreciate you guys uh, clicking on my links and come into my channel uh, because I really enjoy doing this. Until next time.